Hi everybody. What I want to deal with in this lecture is the measurement problem. Now this is the biggest problem that we have in physics. The fact that atoms just don't seem to behave like classical objects. They are completely and utterly different. The behavior of atoms is described by something called the wave function as a wave, just the same as any other wave. Now, here's the measurement problem. You go and look it up on Wikipedia. Let me just read it to you, what the real problem is. Now, the wave function was written by Erwin Schrodinger, and it describes something just like a wave. I've got to describe all the different parts of the wave, and it's deterministic. I can say as a wave moves through the ocean, I can pick on any little bit, and as it evolves, I can say where it's going to be. But there's a problem. The wave function in quantum mechanics evolves deterministically. I can determine what's going to happen. It's according to Schrodinger's equation. As a linear, linear, a straight line, I can see what's going to happen. A linear superposition, all the different parts of, of different steps. But actual measurements, when you try and find out where that wave is, always find the physical system, wrong word, it's not physical, in a definite state. Now that's like a wave coming towards a beach. You can pick on any part of the wave that you want. You can say where it's going to be, but when it hits the beach, when you make a measurement, it all arrives in one place. And worse, you can't say where it's going to arrive. But you can write a probability distribution that tells you if lots of waves arrive on the beach, a certain number, 10, will arrive here, 5 here, 2 here, and it's always correct. So we flipped over from a deterministic wave function into a non-deterministic state that suddenly appears here, then I get a different state and another evolution that carries on from wherever it was found. Any future evolution is based on the state the system was discovered in when the measurement was made. It did something to the system. It changed it. That is not a consequence of the wave equation. So I've got this physics, if you like, just going on nicely. And then I try and measure it. And the physics changes. I get something completely different. Well, in our classical world, we don't seem to see that. The lever still behaves as a lever. The solar system can predict where all the planets are going to be. It doesn't suddenly change. And you can hear on BBC Radio 4, in our time, science archives, the measurement problem. There's something at the very small that's completely different from our reality here is a flip over and it's got to do with the, the measuring equipment that's the beach when it hits the beach it all arrives in the same place and I get this probability distribution something's wrong something's very wrong now there must be a mistake we've got the laws at this level physics we know it's wrong we know how to determine what's going to happen in the future. Something must be wrong because we've tested the laws of relativity, Newton's mechanics. We know they are correct. And we've tested the laws of the wave function. We know it is correct. They pass every test every time. That's the biggest problem. They're inconsistent with each other. Well, we know. The universe is not inconsistent with itself. The periodic table doesn't have some bits which don't fit. You see the problem? It's just mind-boggling. And the best minds on the earth just can't come up with an answer. That's why we have Schrodinger's cat. It's deterministic or not deterministic. It's changing from this into this. Now, let's go back in history because there's a mistake, a big mistake, that nobody noticed. We think the flip out has something to do between small and big. But if I go back up here, Newton's mechanics, completely deterministic, 
only works for two bodies, two. As soon as I get to three, his mechanics collapses just the same as the wave function. And I get this behavior here, which is not deterministic. It has deterministic parts in the orbits, but if I look in the rings and belts in the solar system, it's completely not deterministic. That's a problem. But if you don't tell people, if you don't show them, they don't see it. So if I look in my physics book here, physics calculus, a book that I've trusted for years and years and years, and I go and look for the solar system, it's not there. Shocking. It's not there. But if you don't tell anybody, they don't notice. The solar system, if you ask the physicist what the solar system is, they would say chaotic. Clearly not. It has chaotic parts. Now let's go back to Newton. Newton's dealing with something which behaves relative to gravity, the fundamental laws of nature. It's deterministic, but he can't solve the three-body problem. Laplace comes along, and he nails it with this equation here, perturbation theory. But what everybody fails to notice, there is no mention of gravity in here. Physics stops here. Physics stops here. Now, you need to tell everybody that. Physics and mathematics separate. That is a book, Nonlinear Dynamics. Anything which is complex, and that just means three components, no more than that. There is no mention in this book of electromagnetism, gravity, or the strong and weak nuclear force. The fundamental laws of nature are not mentioned in anything in there to do with more than three bodies. Completely shocking. Physics stops here, and I've got a system here which is purely mathematical. It has gravitational gradients, but how that system behaves is purely mathematical. So let's stop here. Let's start again, and we're going to state reality. Because the measurement problem, if I read the next bit, it says, and this is equally shocking, to express matters differently, the Schrodinger wave equation determines the wave function at any later time. It can be determined. If observers, their measuring apparatus are themselves described by a deterministic wave equation, why can we not predict precise results for measurements? Only probabilities. As a general question, how can one establish a correspondence between the quantum and the classical reality? The quantum and the classical, that's the problem. They're inconsistent. But here's the real problem. If I look at the language here, quantum reality, what does that mean? The small atomic level? He's just talking about this state here, the wave equation. What about chemistry? Isn't that just atomic particles? We'll ignore that as well. And then what happens here in a cell? Isn't that just a dynamic system of quantum atomic particles? We'll ignore that as well. So that statement to establish a correspondence between quantum, which is here, and classical, which is just here, faults, massive faults. Here, everything in the universe changes. It flips over from physics into physics, which create the gradients only, and mathematics, which determines the behavior of the system. Purely mathematics, a complete flip over that everybody's ignoring. You cannot ignore that. You cannot ignore chemistry as part of reality. Life is part of reality. The solar system ignored as part of reality by people who should know much, much better. So let's start again, right from the beginning. We're going to change the language. 
behavior. When something behaves, it does something. Something must be making it do something. You need that extra component to make something change. If I've got a star sitting by itself in space, doing nothing, if I bring another star to it, they start to go around each other. It changes. Now, this is where we've got to be careful with the word behavior. The behavior at this level changes when there's a relationship. There's a relationship. I get completely different behavior. And if I add another component to relationships, it flips over again into completely different behavior. Now the universe brings itself into existence. What was there before is all non-physical, there's just forces. But if I have a relationship between the energy released from the strong and weak nuclear force, and I push that against gravity, I get a star, something which behaves as a star by itself. If I have the electromagnetic force which repels and I pull that together with gravity, I get a planet which just sits by itself. Now if I look at the stars in the night sky which are not in a relationship, I can't determine their position. Their position is only relative to the other stars. If there was just one star in the sky, I can only say that is there and I'm here. It's not deterministic, the position of anything. If I have a chair sat in the desert, I walk towards it, I can only say the chair is there and I'm here. So position is not deterministic. And when things are not in the relationships, they behave just what they are. They hold themselves in existence. Now, when we create particles in particle accelerators, almost all of them disappear. They go out of existence. A star holds itself into existence. When it doesn't have that energy pushing out, it collapses into a black hole if it's big enough. And I get no existence. I just get something which is a relationship between the space it's in and whatever's causing that distortion. So I've got to be very careful. There are no absolutes in the universe. There's nothing that sits by itself. Nothing at all. Everything comes as these pairs. Matter, energy, space, time, matter, digits, energy, the continuum, the electromagnetic, continuum, the way, all the waves, they're all just, it, it don't get this and that, they don't get red, then blue, then green, it's all just a continuum. And up here, space and time, quantized by events. So I've got these two different, I've got digits, things behave as a digit, they behave differently when in a relationship and very differently again when in two relationships. Now let's see if that happens down here at the small level. This, nothing to do with size, this flip over here has to do with numbers, mathematics. Down here, I've got a wave function. I can determine what it's doing mathematically, but when I put a detector there, it collapses and I get a particle. It could be here or here. But isn't that a relationship? My detector must be made from atoms. And those atoms must react with the particle, otherwise I'm not going to find out where it is. It flips over into a different state of behavior. Now a particle is not a little grain of substance. It's still energy. It's just behaving differently. It's a flip over, nothing to do with size. So I get H2, something like that. And it's that relationship. But relative to everything outside my little molecule, I still got my wave. Now that's been proved by Anton Zeilinger takes molecules like this, puts them through the double slit experiment, behaves as a wave, relative to the equipment. But to each other, the particles behave as particles. That has been established. We know that is true. Everything seems to be just relative to something else.
can't have space if I don't have some parts in it. I can't have some parts without somewhere to be. Everything we're going to say now is just relative. If I can't establish something's position up here, I just get a random distribution of stars in the sky. I can't say where it is until I observe it. When I observe this, I can say where it is, but before that, I can't. It's the same thing. I've got chemistry which I'm ignoring, life which I'm ignoring. I get a flip over. But if that's what the universe does, it flips over. Nothing to do with size, to do with a number, an amount. It's consistent with what's happening up here. It's consistent. I get something which is behaving as a star. Flips over and something behaves as a binary star, but that's another unit. Flips over and something behaves as a system, a solar system, which from a distance looks like another unit. I just get something, a digit, which changes into a relationship, which changes into three digits, and then it flips over. Three. Let's see what happens down here. A quark behaves as a quark by itself. Something behaves by itself. Two quarks, a quark and an antiquark, behave as a meson, behaves as something different. It's flipped over, the behavior is changed. And three quarks behaves as a proton, completely and utterly different. Now we've been ignoring that, three quarks, the behavior changes each time. It's consistent with what I see at this level and what I see at this level. I've got systems here. Now what happens inside a cell is the same as this. Physics. Physics stops here. Chemistry. If I've got three components, chemistry. It's not in the physics books because it's a complexity. Anything with three components is complex. The mathematics has changed. And it changes again here when I get into a system. This is purely mathematical. This mathematical structure is geometry. Now, geometry can just describe relationships, and it always adds up. 22 over 7 equals pi equals equals 22 over 7. But as digits, I get this randomness. If I try and calculate it out, I get 3.14. I don't just get 3. It doesn't calculate out. Now, let's just say behavior can be whatever, whatever, not trying to force upon the universe. There's this behavior and this behavior, they're inconsistent, there's only two kinds of behavior. What about living things? Isn't that part of reality? Of course it is. Now let's go back over here. I want to talk more about systems and complexities, the whole of chemistry, life, and the solar system. That's all non-linear. So why isn't that in the physics book? Nobody knows what it is. Now this mathematics, chaos and non-linear dynamics, is the newest branch of mathematics. It's only really, we've only got our teeth into it in the last 30 years ago. Now I've been reading this book for 20 years. But let's see what he says. Now this is Robert C. Hilborn. You can look him up on the internet. He's working away in Dallas. Brilliant, a very well respected mathematician and scientist, so it's not what I think. He says, if we look at the features providing an explanation for non-linear behavior, we find the common features are not the physical features of the system. That means it's nothing to do with what the components are. And systems like this, they can be electrical, social, biological, chemical, Cognitive, it doesn't matter what it is, they all share the same mathematics, they all show the same kind of behavior, which sometimes is, sometimes is deterministic and sometimes not. The solar system has deterministic parts, sometimes not. I need a big dominating body to get my clock from the solar system. The same as all the big planets, they all have non-deterministic parts in the ring. If I don't have that big body, body, I've got three equal sized body, I just get chaotic systems. So we really do have to change our minds. What he says, this is disturbing to many scientists, but because it's disturbing does not mean that we 
can't say it's science. We have to accept what we see as reality. To answer this question, we have to cast off the blinders that many scientists have worn. In some sense, we expect the complexity, just three components, is embodied in the fundamental laws of gravity. It's not. Well, we can state it's not, and he states it's not. The fundamental laws do not give us the means to talk about complexity. We have to go beyond predictions made by the fundamental laws. That's gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force. They don't tell you what's happening here. Physics stops here. It's purely mathematical. Just mathematics that's happening here. I've got electromagnetism causing attraction, a set of mathematical rules. I've got electromagnetism providing me with gradients, but it's a mathematical system. Now, if I get down to the basic building blocks of the universe, it's just mathematical. Electrons, leptons, neutrinos, we call them. They don't respond to the strong nuclear force. They have no volume. They're purely mathematical. If I look inside a proton at a quartz, they're purely mathematical. And it's this flip over, like at one proton. But now, if I do the same thing again, if I keep adding another component, if I put a neutron in there, I then get, I clump those two together, I then get a nucleus. Now the neutron is made of three components. One, an electron, behaves as an electron by itself. A neutrino behaves as a neutrino by itself. I put them together with a proton, I get a neutron. I get something completely different, it's flipped over. But if I look inside the neutron, I find three quarks. The electron disappeared, the neutrino. Well, it just looks like everything just keeps changing all the time. Now this is what we think with string theory, that I just have a different state of energy and I get the different behavior. Well, clearly, if I get then the nucleus, I just plug these together. One neutron, proton, and electron behaves as an atom, which behaves completely differently from a nucleus. And I clump them together and I start to get molecules. Now I get chemistry, I get purely mathematical systems. The chemistry which become ever more complex all the time. Now I can see that this system is self-organizing. The cell life, it's always self-organizing. It has a deep underlying mathematical property of self-organization, which we know about. It's in this book. It tells you. The physics of fractals, their self-organization, they have self-organizational criticality. But there are lots of complexities which don't. They have far more uncertainty than certainty. So what we've had to do, now we've solved the measurement problem, it's nothing to do with small and big, it's to do with numbers. That and that. There is, there is a limit between a point-like object and gravity, that's called the Planck mass, now we know that. Now that limit, you can't have a point-like object in the universe, bigger than something, it's about the size of a flea egg. That's a eukaryotic cell. This flip over mathematics, we see that in the Mandelbrot set of fractals. It produces fractals which get ever more complex, and then it stops and flips back to that simple, single state at the beginning and repeats itself. The flea egg. That's what we see, the eukaryotic cell. The complexity stops there, then I get multi-celled living things which do the same thing. They use the same mathematics again. And then I get social behaviour in animals which uses the same mathematics again to get the animals to relate to each other using the same mathematics as the systems which, which make our bodies, our breathing systems, our digestive systems and our cells, which is the same mathematics which is inside the cells, the same mathematics as chemistry, which is different from that. So that's the measurement problem. It's a problem we have been forcing on ourselves. You know, we have to take our blinders off. That problem has gone. I must now state that this mathematics is the hidden reality that was hidden from Einstein and Schrodinger that couldn't see it because this mathematics doesn't have any components which only behave relative to this. I've got 
got the same components here. So I can't see that suddenly it's doing something different. I've got different realities. Now, mathematics, what happens down here, we've decided to say, well, maybe this wave function doesn't collapse here. It generates other universe with other probabilities in Then we've lost it. Other realities. Instead of something as simple as chemistry, the many worlds theory. Well, part of that is right, but it doesn't generate other universes. It's all here. This is the many worlds. There are many realities at the same time. A proton has a reality which behaves relative to an electron, a reality which behaves relative to a neutron, a reality which behaves relative to gravity, all at the same time. So I can say, a living thing, it's just a mathematical system which uses electromagnetic gradients, and electromagnetic attraction, that's what it is. It also behaves, a cat behaves relative to gravity and this mathematics at the same time. It's not a problem anymore. Now, if we lay out the universe like this with, without any, with zero absolutes, the same must be true in mathematics. Mathematics must have these flip-overs. But if I go right down to the bottom of mathematics and boil it all away, I find universal constants. E, digits, the universal base, the pi, to do with relationships. Relationships which, if I try and express pi as digits, I can't do it, it doesn't come out, but the relationships, I can do it. And what we've seen now is that the reality that we live in has deterministic and non-deterministic parts. It flips in and out. It's deterministic. It goes back to being a combination of both. I can determine it is a star, but I can't determine where it's going to be in the night sky. It's always both. Both at the same time. I can't have anything which is just one. Now that's going to show up in the forces, the basic building blocks. If I get the forces, gravity is part of the cosmological constant. Now there are three kinds of everything in the universe. One, two, three. Mathematical. It's, it's just the same pattern. Three kinds of forces all going to come in pairs. So let's separate out. Gra gravity, the cosmological constant. Gravity just means I've got some of this sitting here. But if I haven't got any of that, then I've got this. One is the absence of the other. One kind of opposite. Opposites which are similar. Electromagnetism. Can both attract that together and hold it up at the same time. It can act against itself. With a strong or weak nuclear force. Dissimilar opposites. I can see that in mathematics. If I go back here, three ways, I start to get the numbers. Now one, not a prime number. Now we've said that one of anything just tells you what it is. We're going to say that one's not a number, it's a digit. When things behave as a a digit, one quark, behaves like a quark. Three quarks behaves as a proton. Behavior changes. But when, when I get one of something, and I start counting with that one, the mathematics stays the same. Now, to build the numbers up, if it's purely mathematical, here, I must have something that shows that mathematics brings itself into existence the same as everything else in the universe. Well, I've got prime numbers, which are random. And they bring composite numbers into existence. They build them. There's one unique way of making all the composite numbers from the primes. And when I find that I suddenly can't build one, I get the next prime. I can put numbers like this, or numbers like that. Dissimilar opposites, similar opposites. Well, this one is the absence of the other. Same as the forces. And there are three pairs of quarks and three pairs of leptons. And now I'm going to say, if I go over to my, a number line, three pairs of dimensions, which have been staring us in the face for a long time. 3D, we think we're 3D. But you tell me that left and right is not when dimensions pair off. And if I've got a brain, any animal with a brain has six dimensions, head and tail, front and back, Say it's not. You have to state it to yourself. That's how we understand things in language. So now, my number lines, 
imaginary numbers of time and space, energy. Minus one times minus one. Two electrons are both minus, but if I bring them together, they repel, and I get positive volume for two minuses. Makes sense. Matter. Positive numbers. But now, I've got disordered systems of complexities, ordered systems of complexities here, and there's no, it's not deterministic. There's no limits to how different life can be. But it always comes within parameters. The universe does not play dice. I can behave how I want, but I, I can make all sorts of small choices. But I will behave as a human being. I'll behave relative to human rules. And if I don't, you start to get very uncomfortable very quickly. So the non-deterministic bits here are all in the details. And what's deterministic is the overall pattern. Same as a snowflake, always six, but all the details are not deterministic. That's okay now, because we're saying that reality is both deterministic and not deterministic. So does that show up in mathematics? It's just relative. And if it's, it's digits, it's not going to add up. But as a relationship, it does. Well, we've written this little equation that shows the relationship between E, the base of all mathematics, and pi, it almost works out, 0.497. I don't want it to work out. These two numbers are transcend transcendental and irrational. But as a relationship, I can say, well, it's just a relationship at the bottom of mathematics. That's all I want to see. I can't have something sitting by itself. Now, some of you who are good at mathematics will recognize the most, the biggest problem in mathematics is something called the Riemann hypothesis, which has to do with this. When you feed complex numbers, the something called the zeta function, get pi squared over six. That's also the same for prime numbers as well. So the relationship between prime numbers, complex numbers, and composite numbers from this. And there's a relationship between these two. Now, as a relationship, I can't get things to calculate out. But as a relationship, I can. So if I apply this to my new number line here, and I don't use arithmetic to say the thing is with the Riemann hypothesis, the imaginary number, when I feed them in, can be whatever it wants, and the real number is always a half. Well, if I say that with arithmetic, I can't prove it. But if I use geometry, and remember, the universe comes as relationships or digits. If I use geometry, it is always a half, and I can prove it. And I can do everything in the universe use of geometry or arithmetic. So that's a, just a different way of looking at everything. The whole of reality has changed. There are multiple realities and there are an infinite number of different realities all the time. It is the many worlds, but they're not in another universe. They're all here. How different is that? And it's been staring us in the face. It's the biggest mistake that science has ever made. And it's really a human mistake because the complexity of all this stuff that we've got now, chemistry, all of biology, particle physics, mathematics of life, I understand you. I really hope he gets to see this. Constants of nature. When you trawl through all these books trying to find a common thread, and you've got that mistake which is holding us all back. There's no way you can do it. Now, one of my jobs was prepare, preparing information for courts of law. And you look for that consistency. And what we see here is the universe is just how it needs to be to exist, but it's consistent with itself. And it's not surprising that it's somebody who just deals with information not the physicist. The physicist 
this hidden reality which we've had. Now the physicists are still trying to solve this problem just using physics, where it flips over here into something completely mathematical. And that's how your brain works. It's nothing to do with the physical components. Your mind sits outside that, and you can feel that. You can, it transcends it. This mathematic transcends the components and the fundamental laws. And that's how your mind works. You can transcend your body and your brain. This mathematics now means that I can look back at myself and I can state what's happening. It's just the same as the rest of the universe. So that's one really big mess sorted out into a consistency. And there's a huge amount of information which has come out of this, but I don't want to put it all in one lecture. Oh, why number six? It's the first number with three components. It's also carbon. Six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. As soon as you hit carbon, you have all the possibilities of life. Your place on carbon. And this a completely unique way. The magic hexagon. There's only two of them, a left and right one. They, they're unique. The universe has these unique details. So we really are, you really are unique. And now it's allowed. Not by the laws of physics, but the laws of mathematics.